Welcome to our exploration of the Keystone Ordnance Works, our biggest adventure ever. The Keystone Ordnance Works, or KOW, once sprawled over 14,000 acres of farm and wetlands in Greenwood Township, Pennsylvania. Our exploration begins in the acid area. Manufacturing TNT requires toluene, nitric acid, sulfuric acid, sodium sulfite, plus a lot of water. The water system that the Army built was vast. 17 wells capable of supplying 17,000 gallons of water per minute were established along the Conneaut Outlet. These wells ranged from the village of Geneva to a point about one mile west of Cochranton along the French Creek and covered more than 100 miles. Once water reached the KOW, it was stored in two ground reservoir sites, each of which had its own pumping station. Also at KOW, there's three water towers and a large concrete standpipe. The long trough you'll see once held a large cooling tower for acid production. During our exploration, water could still be heard rushing underneath the pump house. There's many holes and underground cavities on the site, which makes exploration potentially hazardous. These are the few remaining office buildings. Once operational, KOW employed 1,900 people, of which 350 were women. Labor was organized into several divisions, an acid division, TNT division, laboratory division, technical division, maintenance and utilities, service, transportation division, and the office division. There are several unions represented at KOW, the United Gas, Coke, and Chemical Workers, American Federation of Laborers, International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers, and the AFL International Association of Machinists. Now, if you wanted a job at KOW, you had to pay the union $20 before you could begin working. And in a compromise to ease the labor shortage, you get by with just putting $5 down, and the rest of your $20 initiation fee was paid in weekly payments. This building was one of several involved with the manufacturing of sulfuric acid. Sulfuric acid is one of the oldest known industrial chemicals and more sulfuric acid is produced and consumed than any other chemical in the world. The facilities here were all part of an oleum plant. And while KOW was owned by the Army, the acid operations were managed by a private company called General Chemical Company. Coal was stored in this part of the building. Keeping it under roof kept it dry and easy to access even during the winter months. Now, planning for KOW began in October 1941, before the U.S. formally entered World War II, and actually on November 6, 1941, the federal government announced its intention to build a TNT factory. So keep in mind, at this time, Germany had already conquered Poland, France, North Africa, and was on the march to Moscow. Japan had conquered most of the Pacific. This silo was used to distribute coal to the trucks. Coal came in by rail car to the left, and a series of conveyors would have loaded it into the silo and also into the storage shed we just visited. Sulfur was stored in this part of the structure. A unique feature is the minimal use of steel because wet sulfur readily corrodes steel. This explains the wood roof beams and the smooth concrete walls. The wooden buckets were used to move the sulfur. Some of the buckets still have brackets on the bottom, where there once were wheels. We surmise the bottom of the buckets are made from lead since it doesn't react with sulfur. Hmm. The acid area started operation on October 6, 1942, and the TNT area on October 22nd, less than 12 months after construction had begun. Curiously, Construction had begun even before all the land had been fully acquired. In all, 234 farms were purchased starting on December 5th of 1941. Most families were only given 15 days notice to vacate their farms, a proposition made even more challenging during the blizzards and temperatures below zero. These families had to find and purchase new property, plus move all their livestock, feed, farm implements, and household goods in the snows in the middle of winter. Some of the farms have been family owned for over 150 years. Oh. 
As we entered this building, Carmela remarked it was like entering the jungle world of Jumanji. Here is where the first step of turning raw sulfur into acid begins. To do so, sulfur is heated with oxygen to create sulfur dioxide. So you'll see along the perimeter of the entire building the remains of a multitude of small fire brick ovens. And even 70 years later, the walls of these furnaces are still blackened. Piping, valves, pumps, and other items were all left after more useful contents were removed when KOW was shut down. Accident prevention was a constant campaign, both during construction and once operation began. Strangely enough, the blasting crew which handled the many explosives during construction was one of the few departments to experience not a single accident. Perhaps a mundane yet critical statistic was the bus safety record for transporting the workers to KOW. No incidents were recorded from July 1st to November 1st, 1942, during which the buses traveled 740,000 miles and carried over 790,000 passengers. In a testament to the workers' dedication, absenteeism was lower at KOW than similar plants with comparable weather conditions. Even during the winter of 1942-43, to 43, when temperatures plunged to minus 15 degrees, truancy of office and skilled workers was approximately 3% lower than other TNT factories. Here we found the skull of a dead rodent, guessing to be a raccoon, skunk, maybe even a possum. So there you see the two buildings we just toured. There's the offices. And the long trough is where there used to be a large cooling tower, part of what they called the oleum plant. And then the next part of our exploration, we're going to head over to this really cool building that has who knows what kind of different piping and stuff, but more of the sulfur processing. And in the background, you see the power plant and the three water towers. This structure is steampunk heaven. We believe it was part of the final processing of the sulfuric acid and oleum. The building is obviously in a hazardous condition. The inset photo from the Society of Rust Belt Exploration was taken in 2012, nine years before this video. Our projection is, in just a few more years, the entire building will have fallen in on itself as it succumbs to exposure and age. The building itself was made from wood because wood is more resistant to acid spills than either steel or concrete. What's really amazing about the structure is it is all designed long before the era of computers. And given how quickly the project proceeded, it seems likely the design was at least based on, if not copied from, another sulfuric acid plant at a different location. Carmela and I eventually determined the pump we were looking at was made by Colas. We could not find any information about a company or pump brand named Colas, though. We're covered in asbestos. See? We have a big Colas pump here. There's the belt to drive it. Wow, these are big vats. Expansion couplings. Wow. Is it a D or an O or what? Camilla, this one's in better shape here, isn't it? Yes. Something pumps. Pipes went through there. Research suggests these buildings were used to convert ammonia into nitric acid. 
The process starts by heating ammonia with oxygen in the presence of a catalyst like platinum with rhodium. This forms nitric oxide in water and releases a lot of heat once the reaction is started. The second step is carried out in an absorption apparatus containing water. Initially the nitric oxide is oxidized yet again to yield nitrogen and dioxide. This gas is then readily absorbed by water, which creates diluted nitric acid. There will be a chemistry test at the end. The overall size of Keystone Ordnance Works is astounding. To patrol the sprawling grounds, guards saddled fine horses shipped from Fort Royal, Virginia. All the 48 Bay Sorrel Geldings had been trained by the U.S. Army Cavalry. The horses made good substitutions and could deal with mud and poor weather. Only later did the guards use motorcycles or jeeps. Note that KOW was built on a swamp and any deviation from the roads is going to result in wet shoes. Around March 18, 1942, while KOW was still under construction, the site literally turned into a sea of mud due to a thaw of snow and heavy rains. Conditions were so bad that all the roads to the plant became impassable and no vehicle could get to the center of the grounds for 30 hours. In another example of swampy conditions, a young woman walking to her workplace sank up to her knees in the mud and when she finally climbed out it, it was without either her shoes or stockings. Unshaken, she washed her feet at the administration building door and went to work barefoot. We now begin the exploration of the laboratories. The chem lab was housed in a large U-shaped building of which one leg of the U is mostly collapsed. The labs were constantly verifying the materials used to make TNT as well as checking the TNT product itself. Many of the chemists were women because of the shortage of men. Allegheny College was engaged to help train the women in the nuances of industrial chemistry. It was noted the women frequently performed superior to men specifically when it came to reading temperatures, charts, and keeping accurate records. A strange feature of this room is there are no interior doors to the rest of the labs. The brick wall seems to have been a fire barrier to prevent disaster from spreading. Here you see the east leg of the labs, totally collapsed. We surmise these are whistles. Given that they are at the lab, they may have been used to sound an emergency. Prior to 1941, the U.S. made TNT by adding nitric acid to toluene, as this was considered the only safe method. The turning point came when Lieutenant Colonel John Harris visited a small Canadian TNT plant near Montreal. His visit to the plant had not been planned in advance, but was added at the end of his itinerary to fill in the time before his train left. To his surprise, the Canadians were doing things backwards by putting toluene into acid instead of acid into toluene which resulted in making TNT much faster. When Colonel Harris reported his findings, the American TNT FET makers were skeptical, but a successful trial of the new process at the partially built KOW convinced them, and soon all TNT production was using the process. Production tripled, and the cost of TNT dropped from 12 cents a pound to 6 cents. All lockers. I must confess it was with some trepidation I followed Carmela into this part of the lab. The floors appeared ready to collapse at any time. There wasn't much left to indicate that this had been a home for chemists other than the acid-resistant sinks. Any useful material was sold when KOW closed, and a few extra windows had been stored in the building.
The Keystone Blast was a newspaper published specifically for the employees of KOW. It was printed weekly and followed a similar format of large daily newspapers. Here's some highlights from the December 17, 1942 edition. The front page headline declared, New 10-bed hospital at Keystone is modern in every respect. Dr. Richard Bates was named chief surgeon of the hospital, which included a new x-ray machine. Page 3 gives insight into the x-ray machine's importance. X-ray reports are sent out to workers, declared the story title. Reports of recent x-ray tests for tuberculosis that were conducted at the hospital at Keystone are now being compiled at the office of the Crawford County Tuberculosis and Health Society. Several hundred KOW workers took advantage of this opportunity to check up on their health. A bizarre feature of KOW are the bones and remains of cattle in the buildings. In the 1960s and 70s, farmer brought in cows and used some of the old buildings as barns. A bit of a carcass here? More bones. There's a rib cage over here. Not being a farmer, it seems odd so many of the cows died around the area and the bodies simply left. One item of note is Greenwood Township now classifies the KOW as pasture land. what's in the basement, which really isn't a whole lot. A large flock of vultures inhabit the grounds. They frequently perch on the water towers and gave chase to Carmela's drone. The big orange brick building in the center of KOW was the power plant. In the old days, it was common to have cogeneration systems. So not only would the power plant generate electricity, the waste heat was used to heat all the buildings on the site and for energy and chemical processing. For reasons we can't explain, the three big tanks were moved behind the power plant sometime after 1960. Note the poor condition of the power plant roof. The part covered by corrugated sheeting used to have a conveyor on it for loading coal into the hoppers. I am standing in the approximate location where coal was unloaded from the train cars. A large conveyor brought the coal up to the roof in a location directly above Carmela. Once inside, the coal hoppers can still be seen. The hoppers fed seven boilers which created steam for the generators. Basement. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, the water table's really high, isn't it? This outer bay would have held switchgear and transformers. Like other buildings, it shows evidence of being used as a barn too. Our guess is the augers and troughs running the length of the building were used to remove the ash. It seems likely the middle bay is where the generators are located. The inset photo is of a power plant at the Morgantown Ordnance Works, and presumably KOW was of similar construction. In every era, a few people try to game the system. Six people at KOW were held for conspiracy for a scheme to get extra overtime pay. The group were led by William Perrin, Jr., age 17, whose job was the time checker. When the others would leave at the end of their shift, William didn't punch him out until later so they could get extra overtime. In return, William took a cut of their pay. The case was cracked when William was arrested by local officers on a charge of carrying firearms without a permit. The police were suspicious when they discovered a rather large check on William that did not correspond to the kind of work that he was doing.
Interesting. There's a little walkway up there. So I guess that went to the outside on both sides, probably up onto the roof. Big exhaust pipes going up through the ceiling. This was one of the many change houses throughout KOW. Employees wore special garments with no metal and non-sparking shoes. Nobody was allowed to wear any jewelry and definitely no matches were allowed, which was a real challenge for some when smoking was much more common. The punishment for a first offense was a week suspension and a second offense resulted in termination. Abundant wildlife now lays claim to KOW, and I startled a squirrel as I walked through this doorway. We were not able to identify the purpose of this building. You can see two large bats and four barrels on the roof. The building was located to the west, removed from the rest of the TNT and acid production. Only the concrete block portion remains. The metal part of the building, which used to house chemical tanks, was dismantled and removed. This is another structure with little history available. The old photo reveals it was once much taller. The sheet metal skin and I-beams were likely cut apart to gain access for salvaging the tanks and equipment inside. Our guess is the building was used to pump and process the toluene that arrived by railcar. It used to be surrounded by a bunch of hot dog shaped storage tanks, and at one time there was an identical structure in the acid area. Other explorers thought these pieces might be part of a mortar shell. However, KOW only made TNT. The loading of explosives into various bombs was performed at the ammunition factories. We found more of these parts later in the acid recovery building and think they were used to reduce turbulent flow within pipes. You might ask, why bother with water towers when the water system was capable of pumping 17,000 gallons per minute? The water towers held reserves for firefighting and could provide a lot of water at high pressure if a fire did break out. This is one of the women's change houses. TNT is highly toxic and during World War I, 17,000 workers suffered diseases because of exposure. Repeated or prolonged exposure can cause a breakdown of red blood cells and have a detrimental effect on the liver and eyes and even potentially death. A traveling hospital bus was used to check the blood count and general health of the workers and check for anemia or respiratory damage. One common experience amongst those working closely with TNT was they all reported their hair turned a red or auburn color. This is another one of the men's change houses, and like many buildings, it served as a barn and graveyard for cows. Because of the toxic nature of all the chemicals, workers were required to shower at the end of every shift, which is why there are so many change houses throughout KOW. In an effort to promote cleanliness, a special soap was developed which turned purple in the presence of TNT. You had to keep scrubbing and washing if any purple bubbles appeared. Soap was dispensed through the soap apparatus tank.
Our exploration now moves to the TNT production area. When making TNT, the first step is to make nitrotoluene, followed by dinitrotoluene, and then the final conversion to trinitrotoluene. To reduce the amount of waste, there was an acid recovery building to filter and convert the used processing material back into useful acid. Only the mono and acid recovery buildings remain today. The buy and try houses were considered too contaminated and burned down. There were 12 sets of identical buildings, each one representing a production line. However, six lines were the most that ever ran simultaneously. We will only show highlights of a few of the buildings which still had unique items in them. The brick buildings were the mono houses. Here toluene was added to the acid at a very controlled rate and temperature. If the process started to get out of control and heat too quickly, a valve could be opened and the contents quickly dumped into a quench tank to stop the reaction. And if things really went south, workers could jump out of the building and run for their lives. All of the buildings in the TNT area featured many doors for quick escapes. And the exits on the second floor featured slides for a speedy getaway. A barrel of toluene rested on the cradle attached to the scale. This way the operator knew how many pounds per minute were being added to the acid. A Bristol chart recorder created a paper graph documenting the temperature and toluene usage over time. This would then have been turned into the quality inspector or to the labs as a means to verify that good product was made. As the toluene was added to the big vat, a paddle inside slowly churned the mixture. Steam circulating through pipes helped to control the temperature. Used acid and fume were reprocessed in these corrugated steel covered buildings. Note the buildings had no insulation and no heaters. The recovery process emitted so much heat that no further heating was required even during winter. The tall ceramic columns absorbed acid fumes and separated the nitric acid from other fluids. The cavities in the floor were cooling troughs. At its peak of operation, the Keystone Ordnance Works was producing 600,000 pounds of TNT per day. For comparison, in 1944 the total German output of TNT was 686,000 pounds per month. Government reports indicate the facility was designed to produce as much as 780,000 pounds per day. The plant was in operation only 15 months when it was ordered to shut down on March 17, 1944. There are 10 other similar TNT plants, although KOW was the largest. After being closed for six months, KOW resumed operations in September of 44. Less than one year later, on August 16, 45, the KOW plant was ordered to cease operations immediately. And by November 23rd, the shutdown of the plant was nearly complete. Cleanup experts had steamed the equipment clean. Some equipment was boiled for 60 hours. A flamethrower was used to heat metal pipes, and sulfuric acid was distilled down and reconverted for peacetime uses. In the late 1940s, the government attempted to sell the site. In August of 1947, the War Assets Administration was selling buildings and materials. Up for bid were 30 sentry towers, 29 guard post buildings, 5 barracks, a loading dock, and 45 other buildings of various sizes. This view is looking inside one of the columns. 
We think cooling water ran through the brick passageways in the middle of the column full of used acid. The bands around the columns provided extra strength, applying a compressive force to the clay tile parts to prevent cracking. Wood helped to distribute the forces evenly and insulated the bands from the heat. Unable to find a buyer for KOW, the facility was put into what was called idle standby for reuse status. On October 8, 1946, the War Department turned over the property to the War Assets Administration. Approximately 14,000 acres were covered in the transfer. The WAA was charged with disposing of the holdings. In October 47, the General Chemical Company purchased the oleum plant in its entirety, which was dismantled and moved elsewhere. Over the next few years, the Army found it was difficult to dispose of KW, and except for several studies which the WAAA contracted out to consultants, there was little activity. A few buildings still had glass piping connecting the columns together. Clear piping allowed the operators to watch the color of the liquid and make adjustments as the color changed. The glass pipes were connected with special couplings which allowed the expansion and contraction of the pipes. In the 1950s, the plant was kept on standby status, and in 1956, it was considered as a site for an air base. Later in 1959, they also had consideration as a state wildlife refuge. Twelve people were still employed from the plant at the time, just for protection and maintenance purposes. And even in the late 50s, another consideration was for a potential missile construction site. One of the acid recovery buildings housed a couple of old vehicles. There was a 1951 Chevy pickup truck and a 1951 Suburban. The Suburban was driven 60,000 miles, which seems like a lot for the 1950s. The odometer for the truck was missing. Part of KOW is now classified as the Keystone Opportunity Zone in hopes of attracting a business. To date, there's been little interest to invest in a contaminated swamp located in a remote spot and removed from a workforce. About the best thing going for it is it's got rail access and it's relatively close to I-79. In closing, please like this video and subscribe to the channel if you found the video interesting. Resources used to make the video are listed in the comments below. Thank you.